so today we're going to be taking a closer look at floral symbolism in Chinese culture. While most of what we'll be talking about today is in reference to traditional Chinese brush painting, I will be taking a broader look at the floral symbolism, um, uh, other types of floral symbolism within Chinese culture and uh, the other aspects of it, such as its relevance to religion and architecture. Uh, so during the first half of the seminar, I want to address some of the most iconic and significant flowers within Chinese culture, many of which you'll be familiar with, even if you don't do Chinese brush painting. Then during the second half, I want to explore some of the more obscure flowers and plants generally that have garnered symbolic significance throughout Chinese history. So ones that you may not have necessarily heard of uh, or be as familiar with, but within China hold great importance. And hopefully this has changed to a slide on the four gentlemen. Um, if someone in the chat could just confirm that that has happened, and then I will know that I'm sharing correctly uh, and I won't have to restart the recording. Let's just double check. Yes, perfect. All right. Fabulous. Uh, so when it comes to floral symbolism in China, it's really impossible to escape the influence of what are known as the, in Chinese, si junzi, for anyone who's learning Chinese, si four junzi, gentlemen, or in English, the four gentlemen. Um, in English, they're sometimes referred to as the four noble ones, or even just the four junzi, in reference to the Chinese term, because junzi doesn't really have a precise uh, translation. A, a woman could be a junzi. It doesn't necessarily mean gentleman. It's more to do with a person of scholarly pursuits. Generally was always a man, but isn't gender specific. But that is a completely different off topic kind of uh, kind of thing. Um, but before we get into what the flowers represent, um, I should probably explain what a junzi is and why you should want to be one, because that is relevant to why these four flowers have been chosen. Uh, so the term junzi can be interpreted to mean person of high stature or son of the monarch. Although, as I said earlier, it's not a gendered term and it can refer to both men and women. Um, for this reason, the translation of gentleman might be somewhat outdated and a better English translation could probably be something like a superior person or a respectable person, usually related to, as I said, scholarly pursuits. This term is most closely associated with the philosopher Confucius, who used it to describe the ideal person. You may be interested to hear, however, that this wasn't the highest attainment within Confucianism. So according to Confucius himself, the ideal personality or state of being is called sheng, and referred to the person basically becoming a saint or a sage, which is the level Confucius himself, of course, attained in his life. Not sort of he didn't set, give that name to himself, but it was given to him uh, by his disciples. Uh, Confucius acknowledged that sagehood was incredibly difficult for the average person to achieve. So he instead created this kind of secondary class known as junzi, which was meant to be a much more attainable goal for the average person. The Junzi would be a person who based their life on Li, which is one of the Confucian principles, known as proper right, and acted according to another Confucian principle, Ren, which means humaneness. So these are two of the five constants of Confucianism. While the Junzi was expected to uphold all of the five constants, these two are particularly significant. So Li refers to someone following proper etiquette and a ritualistic set of behaviors in order to maintain harmony with the environment while Ren would be a person who embodies humanity and therefore possesses all of the highest human qualities. To this day, a lot of cheng yu, or Chinese proverbs, contain the word junzi, which may be, if you're learning Chinese, how you've come across it. So, for example, one such proverb is junzi zhi jiao jie ru shui, or a gentleman's connections are like water which refers to the fact that a gentleman's friendships are as light as water, with no sycophantic behaviour or attempt to manipulate or use each other for personal gain. Uh, so what does all this have to do with flowers and plants, this kind of tangent I've gone on? Well, it's because each of these plants is meant to in some way embody what it means to be the perfect junzi or gentleman. The four gentlemen, as shown here, are the plum blossom, or in Chinese, mei hua, uh, the orchid or lan hua, bamboo, which is just known as zhu, and the chrysanthemum or ju hua. That was pronounced wrong, ju hua, flat tone. Uh, although each one has its own association, so they're not all just meant to be related to what it means to be a good gentleman, they're meant to embody something about what it means to be a good gentleman or a good junzi. Uh, they are sometimes referred to simply as mei lan zhu ju which means plum, orchid, bamboo, chrysanthemum. So using the first 
sort of eliminating the word hua, which just means flower, and it's just mei, lan, zhu, ju. That last two, I understand why that would be hard. It's hard for me as well, uh, if you are learning Chinese. They have been a popular subject in Chinese ink and wash painting since around about the Song Dynasty, so around about 960 to 1279, and are part of a broader category of painting known as bird and flower painting. Uh, you may remember if you came to the seminar on Mahjong that the four gentlemen are also the most common flowers used on the flower tiles within Mahjong uh, because they have such cultural relevance. As you may have guessed, each one of the four gentlemen plays a unique role within this motif, and they are all also each associated with a different season. So the first, the plum tree, is known for blossoming in the dead of winter. Its subtle fragrance is sure to catch you off guard at the coldest time of the year. Although plum blossoms may not be as magnificent to look at as other types of blossoms, like cherry blossoms, for example, the fact that they appear during the desolate des desolation of winter makes them stand out much more. Thus, alongside representing winter as a season, the plum blossom is said to signify the importance of inner beauty and the gentleman's capacity to stand out, albeit in a modest way, even in adverse conditions. So in essence, they embody the idea of perseverance even in the harshest times. Then the orchid is associated with spring and is noticed for its beauty, but also more importantly, its fragility. It is said to be a sort of perfect embodiment of grace with no malice or violence in it. I mean, it's a flower, so it's not going to be violent, but you get what I mean. Uh, most importantly, its fragrance is pleasant, but it's never overpowering, much like the plum blossom. So it therefore symbolizes the gentleman's humility and nobility. So the idea that you should be known through your good graces without kind of overwhelming people with them. Uh, now, the bamboo is somewhat loosely associated with summer, but is mainly included in this motif for its very specific qualities. And bamboo, play, bamboo plays a really important role within most factions of Chinese culture, particularly Taoism as well. Um, so a stalk of bamboo is strong but hollow, which symbolizes the capacity to remain tolerant and open minded while still sticking to your principles. The flexibility of the bamboo stalk similarly plays into this idea as it represents the gentleman's ability to be able to yield when necessary, but to never actually break. So to have incredible tensile strength, but to also be very flexible. It therefore symbolizes the integrity and the upright nature of the gentleman. Then finally, you have the chrysanthemum blossoms in the cool autumn, which therefore foretell the coming of winter. And this is interpreted as boldly preparing to face the obstacles that are coming in your way, coming to, towards you. It thus symbolizes the purity of the gentleman and the concept that a gentleman's virtue will allow them to overcome any obstacle. Now, two of these gentlemen also appear in another common motif in Chinese brush painting, which is known as the Three Friends of Winter. Now, this one is a bit more obscure, so I think some Chinese brush painters may not have heard of this one, but uh, it still plays a relatively important role. Um, so much like the Four Gentlemen, the Three Friends of Winter, or in Chinese they're known as Cui Han San Yo are connected to the concept of a good Confucian gentleman and are comprised of three different plants. These are the pine, known in Chinese as song shu, shu meaning tree, uh, bamboo or shu again, and then again the plum blossom, mei hua. Uh, so they are sometimes referred to simply as song zhu mei, so song from pine, zhu from bamboo, and then mei from mei hua in reference to the names of these three plants. What of course ties these three plants together thematically is that they do not wither as the days get colder and they either blossom or remain colorful and fragrant throughout the entirety of winter. They thus came to symbolize the steadfastness, resilience and determination of the Junzi or the Confucian scholar gentleman. Uh, so this motif of having three friends refers explicitly back to the Confucian Analects, where Confucius describes the three friends, or more importantly, the three types of friendships that you should try to cultivate to become a true gentleman. In accordance with this philosophy, you need friends, one, who are honest and direct with you when you are wrong, two, friends who are trustworthy and reliable when you need help, and three, friends that are knowledgeable, who can guide you and show you things you may not be able to discover on your own. For this reason, the idea of grouping things into three friendship categories was somewhat in vogue throughout Chinese imperial history. Uh, so some notable examples include during the Tang Dynasty, so around about the uh, fourth, fifth century, during the second golden age in Chinese history, uh, a very famous poet known as Bai Zhu Yi grouped together the wine, poetry, and the zither 
as the three friends of the northern window. And another example, the Song Dynasty poet Su Shi or Su Dongpo, another very important sort of Confucian scholar, uh, had the three friends of graciousness, which were the plum blossom, the bamboo, and the scholar rock, because why not include a rock in a group, a list of plants? Uh, you may be surprised to hear that the first mention of the three friends of winter may actually predate that of the four gentlemen. The first person to draw a connection between these three pan- plants was actually the Tang Dynasty b- poet Zhu Qinyu, who referred to them as the three friends of the cold season in a ninth century poem. By the late Song Dynasty, the celebrated artist Zhao Mengjian had made this motif popular in brush painting. The actual term Three Friends of Winter, however, doesn't officially appear until the 13th century, when it was coined by the scholar Ling Jingxi in the record of the Five Cloud Plum College, what a beautiful name, or as it's known in Chinese, Wu Yuanmei Shi Ji, from the Clear Mountain Collection, known as the Ji Shan Ji in Chinese. Uh, in this text, Lin writes, and I'll read out in Chinese first, Ji Qi Zhu Lei Tu Wei Shan, Zhong Mei Bai Ben. Which means, for his residence, earth was piled to form a hill and a hundred plum trees, which along with lofty pines and tall bamboo, comprised the three friends of winter and were planted. Um, So as you can see, so basically the idea is that uh, when a gentleman builds his home, he's built it from a hundred plum trees, then lofty pines as well and bamboo together, which comprise these three friends of winter. So as you can see, flowers were used throughout Chinese culture to represent virtuous qualities, which were often linked to the way the flower blossomed, what it smelled like, and how it appeared generally. While these flowers all played an important role in Chinese brush painting, and they did have a wider symbolic significance within Chinese culture generally, they do not necessarily represent the most important flowers culturally within China. In fact, the unofficial national flower of China isn't even included among them. I wonder if anyone can guess what it is. It's the peony. Uh, so in 1903, the, during the Qing Dynasty, so 1644 to 1911, uh, the Qing Dynasty government announced that the peony would become the national flower of China. In Chinese, it's known as Mu Dan, for anyone who's learning. Uh, unfortunately, however, the People's Republic of China did not uphold this. So when the imperial sort of rule collapsed in China and the Republic started, they decided not to carry it over because they wanted to cut connections with the Qing Dynasty. Uh, although there have been petitions to designate the peony as the national flower, um, even today, its status remains unofficial. Thanks to a nationwide poll that took place in 1994, however, there is no doubt that the peony is China's most beloved flower. In fact, it is so highly revered that it's sometimes referred to as Hua Wang, which for anyone who speaks Chinese will know that means the king of flowers, which I love, uh, and also the Fu Hui Hua, which means flowers, the flower of riches and honor. Their history stretches all the way back to the spring and autumn period, uh, when they were mentioned by Confucius. For centuries, it was known as the Xiao Yao, which is a word that is still in use today, but at some point the name changed to the more conventional Mu Dan. This is possibly connected to the appearance of the red peony, since the term Mu here is an old word, oh no, since the term Dan, sorry, that's here, is one of the old classical Chinese words meaning red. Uh, One of the main symbolic attributes of the peony is that it is double flowered, which is interpreted as a wish not just for riches, but for repeated riches, so riches upon riches. Of course, it goes without saying that red peonies held a special symbolic significance as lucky flowers within Chinese culture, since the colour red is synonymous with good fortune and prosperity. The white peony, however, had a slightly different association. White peonies were often used to represent talented young women who were as intelligent as they were beautiful. So a double threat, this double flowered sort of idea. Um, In particular, this association is most prominent in a famous Kunshu opera known as Mu Dan Ting. For anyone who's familiar with Chinese opera, the peony pavilion, I'm sure sounds familiar. Uh, The peony pavilion is a romantic tragic comedy that was originally written by the scholar Tang Xianzu in 1598 during the Ming Dynasty. So around about 30, the Ming Dynasty was 1368 to 1644. Uh, However, the action of the piece takes place during the fall of the Song Dynasty, so much earlier, during around about the 13th century. 
The story revolves around the daughter of a senior official named Du Li Niang, who is kept inside by her strict parents and who pines for a life outside of the confines of her home. One day, she ventures out into the garden without her parents' permission and ends up falling asleep beneath a plum tree near to the Peony Pavilion. While asleep, she dreams of encountering a young scholar and embarks on a passionate romantic love affair with him. From then onwards, she becomes so haunted by the dream and so lovesick that, believe it or not, she finally dies of a broken heart, even though she hasn't met this person. Uh, even in death, however, she continues looking for the young scholar. Her persistence eventually wins over Yama, the ruler of the underworld, and he allows her to be reincarnated. So three years later, after she's come back to life uh, or been reincarnated, a young scholar named Liu Mengmei is staying at the temple where Du was buried. As he is wandering in the garden, he comes across uh, Du's portrait and feels as though he somehow recognises her. He starts calling out her name, and in response to his calls, the young woman actually emerges from the painting itself. Uh, bear in mind, she is still a ghost at this point, uh, but Liu kind of still falls in love with her anyway, because otherwise it would be a terrible story. On the following day, Liu digs up her corpse, you know, as you do when you fall in love with someone's ghost, uh, and finds that she has come back to life. They both get married and live happily ever after. Very unconventional love story. You wouldn't hear about that on Tinder. Uh, although in this instance, the peony is not so much a real flower as a physical place where the young woman falls asleep, you can already see how the concept of peonies being associated with beautiful, but also very resourceful young women comes in. Its association with romance has been further reinforced throughout the year, and it is now considered customary to give your partner, a pe uh, give your partner peonies as a 12th anniversary gift. Uh, now, one of these paintings is not like the others, and some Chinese brush painters absolutely hate this particular artist. I know one in particular who really, really doesn't like him, but uh, I'll get into that in a second. Um, I'll get into why it's different in a moment. Although it had enjoyed a good reputation throughout early Chinese history, the peony really rose to popularity during the Tang Dynasty, so the second golden age in Chinese history, when it garnered the admiration of the Tang poets. It was said that Emperor Xuanzong of the Tang was a particular fan of the flower, since his beloved consort, Yang Guifei, would often put it in her hair as a form of decoration. In fact, the celebrated poet Li Bai, one of the two greatest poets in Chinese history, was once supposedly invited to the royal gardens at short notice to join Emperor Xuanzong and Yang Guifei, who were admiring the newly blossomed peony. It was there that he supposedly penned the poem Qin Ping Diao, or Pure and Peaceful Tune where he compared Yang Guifei's beauty to that of the flowers that she was gazing at. In the same dynasty, however, legend has it that Emperor Wu Zetian, my favourite Chinese um, figure, historical figure, and the only female emperor in Chinese history, uh, ordered all of the flowers to bloom out of season. So she tried to, I mean, I love her and I think she's great, but she did try and command flowers to bloom when she wanted them to, um, out of season. And then believe it or not, when the peonies disobeyed her, she had all of the peonies in the royal garden dug up and burned. Um, so this is most likely not true and was probably used as a tactic by historians to besmirch her reputation, since the peony was so beloved and such a staple part of Chinese culture by this point that it was actually a pretty sort of poignant jab to make it a politician. Uh, peonies kept in the garden were meant to foretell the future prosperity of the family. And if your peonies did not blossom in a given year, it spelled potential disaster. So thanks to the admiration of these Tang Dynasty poets and artists, the peony's popularity endured throughout the centuries, as evidenced by the three paintings that we have here. So on the left, we have a painting by the Qing Dynasty artist Yun Shouping. In the middle, you have a painting by the Ming Dynasty artist Xu Wei. So as you can see, Yun Shouping's painting is done more in the Gongbi or realistic style, while Xu Wei's work is an ink brush painting, so in black and white. The painting on the right, however, is particularly special and distinct from both of them, and I'll tell you why now, finally. Uh, so the painting on the right um, was painted by a man named Giuseppe Castiglione, and if you think that name doesn't sound particularly Chinese, you'd be right. Uh, Giuseppe Castiglione was an Italian Jesuit missionary who worked in the imperial court under the Qianlong Emperor of the Qing Dynasty, so the last dynasty in Chinese history, a time when a lot of Jesuit missionaries moved to China and became part of the imperial court. They learned to speak Chinese, uh, they learned how to paint, they sort of involved themselves in uh, Chinese gentlemanly culture in order to ingratiate themselves with the uh, ruling classes. So during his time at court, he became obsessed with traditional Chinese painting, and in particular, he developed a fondness for painting peonies. Uh, 
His style was actually marked by an amalgamation of features from both the Western and Chinese painting tradition. So bear in mind, he had come from a Italian painting background, uh, so highly realistic and with an emphasis on the use of light. And then he's moving into a painting tradition that doesn't value any of those things. So he kind of mishmashed the two together. In fact, his work reached such renown within the imperial court that he was even allowed to paint imperial portraits, including at one point portraits of the empress and the emperor himself. Uh, however, I will then pause to note that a lot of people really don't like his paintings. Traditional Chinese brush painters don't really like his paintings now, uh, as opposed to these, which are, of course, very beautiful. But for now, we will take our five minute break with our beautiful little dog flower. And now if you could stop the recording, that'd be perfect. And uh, we'll get we'll jump in. Perfect. So we'll jump into the second half now. Uh, but before we get into talking about some of the more obscure plants, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't say something about the lotus, which is known in Chinese as lian hua. Alongside the peony and the plum blossom, the lotus probably enjoys the third highest status among flowers in China. Although the main difference is that their role is more relevant to Buddhism rather than to brush painting or traditional Chinese culture. That's not to say that you don't find lotus flowers in Chinese paintings, as you can see here in this painting by a contemporary artist named Yu Qigao, but they're not as common as the flowers I've already spoken about, and their significance to Buddhism is arguably far greater. Bear in mind, however, that I'm talking specifically about the Indian lotus here, and not the American or the yellow lotus. Uh, within Chinese, the lotus has two different names, but both of them carry a deep degree of symbolic significance. So the most common name, which I've listed at the top here, Lian Hua, with the first character, Lian, being a homophone for a number of other words. It shares the same pronunciation with Lian, I don't know why I'm going to keep saying Lian over and over again, which means incorruptible or modest, and then also with Lian, which means to join or continuous, uh, and also with Lian, again, which means to unite or to join. Similarly, the name He Hua is a homophone of the word He, which can mean harmony or union. For this reason, two lotus flowers shown together can symbolize a wish for marital bliss. And you see here in particular, so you've got the two lotus flowers, but you've also got these two mandarin ducks, which again was another sort of symbolic, um, symbolically associated with marital union and marital harmony. Uh, the significance of the lotus in Chinese culture comes directly from Buddhism, which means it didn't really rise to prominence in the country until around about the first century AD onward, when Buddhism started to gain traction in the country when it came in via the Silk Road. In terms of Buddhism, it is ranked as one of the eight precious things, and this is connected to the way in which it grows. In a piece of Buddhist scripture known as the, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, Anguttara Nikaya, I'm sorry for anyone who... Uh, who, had, who understood what that's supposed to be and realized how terrible that was. Uh, but within this uh, scripture, the Buddha compares himself to a lotus and explains this comparison by saying that the lotus flower grows out of muddy water, uh, but it grows out unstained. So too did he ascend above the physical world and freed himself of defilement. Within Buddhist symbolism, the lotus thus came to be associated with the concept of purity and liberation from physical desire. So it's not just purity, but purity within um, adverse conditions, so to speak. Uh, so this is reflected in the words of the Song Dynasty scholar Zhou Dunyi, who said, Yu du ai lian zhi chu, yu ni er bu ran, which means I love the lotus because while growing from mud, it is unstained. So this photo is, no, is what's known as the Tiantan Buddha statue in Hong Kong, which has been aptly named, as you can see here, the Big Buddha. Uh, the statue is, seat, is of the, city, the seated or sitting Buddha, who is commonly depicted sitting at the center of a lotus flower. So you can just see the petals coming in around here. In case you're curious, the Tiantan Buddha is the largest bronze statue of the Buddha in the world, towering in at 34 meters or 112 feet in height and weighing more than 250 metric tons or around about 280 short tons. Uh, to put that into perspective, it is taller than Big Ben in the UK and weighs nearly twice as much as a blue whale. Uh, so the associations between the Lotus and Buddha have only become stronger over time. According to legend, when Gautama Buddha took his first steps, lotus flowers sprouted up wherever his feet landed. Uh, 
Within Tibetan Buddhism, there is a famous Buddhist master named Padmasambhava. Padman, Padmasambhava. God, I always get this wrong. Padmasambhava, who is considered by many to be the second Buddha, and whose name literally translates to mean "born from the lotus" or "lotus born." In fact, even the famous Buddhist mantra on Mane Padme Um literally translates to mean "May I become like the jewel of the lotus," with Mane Padme meaning the jewel within the lotus. What are known as lotus thrones or lotus seats, such as the one that you can see here that the Buddha is sat on, are the most common pedestal for important figures within Buddhist art. If you ever visit some of the major grotto sites in China, such as the Mogao Caves near Donhuang or the Maiji Shan Grottoes near Tian Shui, which is up in Gansu province, uh, you may be met with countless images of Buddha and Bodhisattvas, all sat within these beautiful curling lotus petals. So based on this concept of the lotus throne, the lotus position is a common posture that is used for meditation within Buddhism, where the legs are crossed over one another while sitting upright to sort of symbolize the idea of sitting on this lotus throne as sort of Buddhist figures are posed in this way. Outside of Buddhism, however, the lotus began to have an impact on other aspects of Chinese culture as well. For example, the mythological figure He Xianggu, who you can see here, and who ranks as one of the eight immortals according to Taoism, is often depicted holding a lotus flower, which is believed to have both mental and physical healing properties. So each of the eight immortals has a special item that they carry with them uh, that is considered to be, that has magical powers. Uh, and He Xianggu, she has this sort of horsetail whip, but she also has the lotus, she carries the lotus flower with her as well. Uh, similarly, the He He Ar Xian, or Twin Immortals of Harmony and Union, are two other Taoist deities who are often shown with one of them holding a lotus flower. Within Chinese art, it has garnered numerous associations and is involved in several different motifs. So a lotus with a goldfish sing signifies a wish for abundant wealth. Lotuses and ducks together express a desire for happiness, and lotuses with herons symbolize a desire for progression. Within literature, it also became connected with the idea of a woman who has a pure and noble disposition. So the greatest example of this is the Qing Dynasty classic and one of the four great classical novels of China, The Dream of the Red Chamber, when the honest and upright maid Qing Wen is transformed into a lotus fairy after her death. From a darker perspective, bound feet were historically known as lotus feet, which was a term intended to praise their beauty. As an interesting side note, within the Chinese lunar calendar, the sixth lunar month is sometimes referred to as the He Yue, or the Lotus Month. Uh, now to sort of finish up for today, I want to round out our discussion by talking about some more obscure flowers and plants that bear some symbolic significance within Chinese culture. So for a lot of these, there isn't really that much information about them, so it will be more of a case of quantity rather than quality, I'm afraid. Uh, but I still think they're quite interesting, and one of them you're probably quite surprised by, which is the cabbage, because Chinese cabbage is actually really important in Chinese culture. Uh, so I bet you weren't expecting me to start talking about a cabbage in this seminar, but I am, and I love Chinese cabbage as well, and it's delicious and very versatile. Go to your lo local Chinese supermarket and buy some, they're great. Uh, in Chinese, it's known as bai cai which means sort of the white vegetable or the white cabbage. So this image specifically is known as the jadeite cabbage, or sometimes the jadeite cabbage with insects. And it's a piece of jadeite that has, as you can see, been carved into the shape of a Chinese cabbage. Uh, the reason why it's sometimes known as the jadeite cabbage with insects is because there is actually a locus and a catadid that are camouflaged within the leaves. But thus far, I have spent ages looking for them and I cannot find them, certainly not in this photo. Uh, so maybe one of you will have better luck. Oh, you know what? As I'm saying this, I think it's there. Tell me if I'm wrong. God, what are the chances that I've done this seminar so many times before and this is the one time when I find the bug in the cabbage? I've been looking that hard, I guess. Uh, so to this day, we don't really know who carved this sculpture. And the only information we have about it is that it was originally on display within the Yonghe Palace of the Forbidden City, which was the residence of the consort Jin, one of the Guangxu Emperor's concubines. It is speculated that she received it as part of her dowry in 1889. Nowadays, however, it is on display at the National Palace Museum in Taipei, Taiwan. In terms of size, it is only about the size of a human hand, so it's a lot smaller than this photo might lead you to believe. It makes it look like it's a giant cabbage-sized uh, sculpture, but it really isn't. It's very small. What makes it particularly special is that although it has been carved to look like a cabbage, it is made from one solid piece of jade, which happens to have the perfect colour combination that matches that of a real cabbage. Uh, 
it was actually kind of, I love how I'm saying this like it's amazing it, it looks like a cabbage guys can you believe it but I think it's really cool uh, it was actually carved from a single piece of half white half green jadeite that had numerous blotches and cracks on it which were made to look like the veins of the cabbage leaf since this sculpture was given as a gift to the consort Jin, it has been speculated that it is symbolic of female virtue, with the white stalk representing purity, the leaves signifying fertility up here, and then the two insects representing children. Research has debunked at least part of this theory, however, as the katydid or the Chinese bush cricket in Chinese culture was associated with entertaining guests at palace banquets and would thus never have functioned as a symbol of fertility. It didn't make sense. The tradition of carving jadeite and nephrite into the shapes of food was very commonplace in China, particularly during the Qing dynasty, so the last dynasty in Chinese history, uh, with Chinese cabbages being often a popular subject because their colour scheme matched common varieties of jadeite and nephrite. The cabbage in general within Chinese culture carries the connection of being lucky, since the second part of his name is a part homophone for the word tai, so tai going down is fourth tone, tai is second tone, and it means wealth or money. Since the core of the cabbage is white and there, uh, it's therefore associated with purity, it is also sometimes used to represent the innate purity of human nature, so very deep for a simple cabbage. Uh, so now you may recognize this particular vegetable from our class if you came to the seminar on musical instruments, with your instrument being pictured here known as the hu lu si. The bottle gourd or the hu lu has held an undoubtedly important place within Chinese culture for centuries. Some of you may also know it by its English name of the calabash. Generally speaking, it is served an ancient um, it served as an ancient symbol for health throughout Chinese history and was believed to have almost mythical healing properties. This was undoubtedly connected to the fact that doctors would historically carry medicine inside of dried and hollowed out watertight containers that were made from these bottle gourds. So that's why they were so closely associated with health. In terms of traditional Chinese medicine, it is believed that the hu lu can absorb negative earth-based qi, which would otherwise cause the person to develop a variety of different ailments. This association has been further solidified in the form of the Taoist immortal Li Tie Guai. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the eight immortals of Taoism, He Xianggu, uh, she carried the lotus flower. So Li Tieguai is another one of the eight immortals, but he is associated with healing and he therefore carries a gourd either slung over his shoulder or held in his hands. So that's one of his magical items. This gourd supposedly held magical medicine within it that could cure any illness and it never ran dry. So Li Tieguai would travel throughout the country dispensing it to the sick and needy. Sounds pretty awesome. Uh, some mythical accounts even state that in the evening, Li Tieguai would disappear into the gourd and it would function as his bedroom as well, which I think is really cute. Kind of like a Pokemon in a Pokeball, that's how I imagine it, for anyone who knows what that is. Uh, this became a common trope within Taoist legend, much like the genie, where Taoist masters would hide themselves within gourds and then just appear whenever they were needed. Now, another common trope featured um, this image, the image of the Taoist adept wandering the country, carrying a gourd filled with magical potions. So gourds very closely associated with, associated with Taoism more than Buddhism. Uh, you may remember one of the stories we read, if you ever came to the Halloween special that we did a couple of, we've done it two years in a row now, in which a Taoist priest captures a demon by sucking them up into a magical gourd. So they have these sort of magical properties of healing with these potions inside them, and also this sort of infinite capacity to hold things uh, so you can get sucked up inside them. Much like other flowers and plants we've spoken about today, there is also a linguistic symbolism that is associated with the gourd. So the first half of its name, Hu sounds like another word, Hu, which means to protect, and also Hu, which means blessing. Over time, it became popular to grow gourds within special earthen moulds, which is how we ended up with the double gourd that you see here, where it's got kind of pinched in at the middle. So it looks like almost like two gourds attached to each other with this little pinch bit. This was initially designed so that gourds could be used to hold crickets, which are popular pets in China. These decorative gourds are often painted, as you can see here on this uh, instrument, with flowers and leaf motifs that match the shape of the gourd. In terms of Chinese brush painting, the most common motif associated with the gourd is of large gourds and small gourds shown together, along with creepers, which together represent a wish for many descendants, as the gourd contains many seeds. So this motif is known in Chinese as the guadian nian nian. Uh, to give you an idea, 
here's oh, I said here's a painting there we go I did have the painting ready here's a painting showcasing this motif by a Qing dynasty painter named Jiang Ren so you can see here you've got the small gourd big gourd small gourds here as well and then creepers so you've got big gourds of the parents small gourd the children and then this idea of having lots of seeds so very fertile and with that we will finish up for today uh, so now for our discussion uh, or now if you could turn the recording off as well